In the 1950s, Gerard Vaucouleurs was cataloguing galaxies and noticed that the bright galaxies fell along a great circle in the sky. He realized that the galaxies were distributed in a flattened disk, and that their strongest concentration was in the direction of the constellation Virgo. The Virgo cluster is the center of the largest physical aggregate of galaxies we can study in detail. We will use our understanding from the previous episodes where we saw higher redshift for companion galaxies and examine how the Virgo cluster is structured and how it might well be evolving. If we examine the different types of galaxies and their location and start by looking at the giant ellipticals then M49 pops out as the brightest at the centre of the cluster, and a line of bright ellipticals that sit above it. Spiral galaxies are known for their bright young stars. Radio galaxies are emitting radiation due to the rapid motion of charged particles. If we examine their position in the Virgo cluster, then both appear to be arranged in a giant spiral with the younger objects out towards the ends of the arm. The brightest galaxy in the Virgo cluster is M49. It has strong X-ray and radio emissions. If it had ejected material roughly north-south in the past and had continued this process of ejection as it rotated counterclockwise for about an eighth of a turn, then we would expect to see a spiral pattern roughly as we see with the radio galaxy distribution. So what could have ejected out of M49? If we examine the north-south line across M49, we find two of the brightest radio sources in the sky, M87 and 3C273. Is it any surprise to find these two bright radio sources across from the brightest galaxy in the cluster? If we now turn our attention to M87, then here we also find a series of smaller elliptical galaxies aligned along the famous blue jet with a galaxy. If we zoom out a little from here, even more X-ray sources are located along this same line, including M86 and the bright quasar PG1211 plus 43 that we covered in part one. We know that PG1211 is actually a Seyfert galaxy, which is also ejecting material. Here we see a clear hierarchy of older galaxies creating newer ones, which in turn create newer ones themselves, and so this process goes on and on and on. If we jump back to the diagram showing the positions of the spiral galaxies, we can see that if we overlay the ellipticals, that the spirals seem to form a hollow oval around the line of elliptical galaxies. This fact was originally noted by Gerard Vaucouliers but was assigned to a cluster behind the Virgo cluster due to the higher redshift. Is it instead possible that these elliptical galaxies eject material that form these spiral galaxies which end up with a higher redshift? Does this indicate at least three generations of galaxies? If we add into this the few galaxies in the Virgo cluster which have a blue shift, then maybe this goes up to four or more generations that are visible. Now one thing I would like to point out is that in Arp's concept he saw this change in redshift was caused by the age of matter. The younger it was, the less mass it had and therefore the more redshifted the light becomes. Now I have covered this concept elsewhere if you are interested. The important point is that there may be different ways to explain this redshift that still fit in with the concept of younger objects causing more redshift than older ones without requiring this concept of mass increasing with age. Now I will be examining all of the evidence and looking at different ways of interpreting this in the near future. For now, I want to make sure we see the possible connection with the fact that this may well be showing us a successive generation of galaxies. The Centaurus line. If we examine any other giant radio galaxy not in the Virgo cluster, Will we once more see this same pattern? If we examine the area around Centaurus A, then we see six of the seven brightest galaxies fall along a line centered on the radio galaxy Centaurus A. Centaurus A has a well-marked radio jet, which in turn coincides with the X-ray jets. Now we once more see that there is a continuous rotation 
of about an eighth of a turn from the line of the outer galaxies and the filament to the direction of the inner jets. We also see redshift changes along this line, higher values closer to the parent and then decreasing going down. But we also see some along those lines which have even higher redshift values. IC 4329A has identified quasars around it. This is a Seyfert galaxy. Now this Seyfert galaxy is itself a companion to IC 4329, which is a bright elliptical galaxy with a much lower redshift, similar to M87 and the ejection of PG 121143. So in Centaurus A, we have three generations of galaxies with progressively higher redshifts. There are no other blue shifted galaxies in this cluster, and this may indicate that this is a newer cluster, possibly formed out of the Virgo cluster. It is located only 50 degrees south in the supergalactic longitude. Our own local group of galaxies lie very close to the same plane, and might well be associated with Centaurus A. If M49 sits at the centre, and this was responsible for the ejection of the material that forms the Virgo cluster, is this process running down or is it just in a quiet phase? M49 is certainly not as bright in terms of radio and X-ray compared to M87. If we look at quasars, which would be the youngest ejected material, then we find an intriguing picture of M49. Initially, the quasars in this area appear just as a random collection, but if we filter this for the brightest quasars, we see the following. A beautiful line running through M49. We see a steady decrease in the redshifts as they move further out from M49. If we examine the line in the opposite direction, we find a disturbed dwarf galaxy UGC 7636. Midway between M49 and this dwarf galaxy, there is a hydrogen cloud. Now, in mainstream science, these quasars are not thought to reside in the Virgo cluster due to their redshift. Now, we have already seen some examples in part one where there was clear evidence of an association between the quasar and its host galaxy. In 1970, it was shown that in the northern hemisphere, the brightest radio quasars were associated with the brightest galaxies, which we of course find in the Virgo cluster. When the Palomar Bright Quasar Survey surveyed the northern sky and you examine the locations of the quasars, then you would originally expect the quasars to be distributed randomly across the entire sky. That is not what you find. Instead, they are all concentrated within the Virgo cluster. If quasars are indeed the most distant objects that they are claimed to be, then you would expect their light to show polarization due to the light from them passing through magnetized plasma on their long voyage to us through extragalactic space. In 1968, one astronomer showed that this was indeed true. After careful correction for the Faraday rotation out of our own galaxy, P. Kronberg and J. Perry published a list of 115 quasars, of which 92 are plotted in this diagram, and this led to the exciting conclusion that distances to quasars could be measured by their mean Faraday rotation. Sadly, this excitement would not last long, as it was soon discovered that a quasar with a redshift of z equals 2 did not have twice the rotation of a quasar with a redshift of z equals 1, but instead it had a third of that of the one at z equals 1. Now one thing that does spring out from this diagram is the peak at z equals 1. And this may well fit with the fact that these are also the most luminous quasars and would therefore be at the greatest distance. If you take the z equals 1 quasars, it will come as no surprise that these are associated with galaxies inside the Virgo cluster. We also see that there is a predominance for one direction of rotation. This shows that the magnetic field is dominating in one direction. If these quasars were much further in terms of their distance, then this should look far more random than it does. In 1995, two Chinese astronomers analysed the bright quasar survey in the region of the Virgo cluster. And it illustrates beyond doubt that the 178 quasars clearly fall closer to the cluster of galaxies than they would at random. 
they also discovered that the most luminous and massive galaxies had more numerous quasars located closer to them. On the other hand, the brighter the quasars were, the more separate they were from the galaxies. Now one very important point about this association is its implication for gravitational lensing. They point out in their work that there was no association at very small separation, where you would be most likely to see the lensing effect. You will of course not be surprised that their paper appeared both in the European and Chinese journals, however, in the European version, they removed the criticism for gravitational lensing. In 1993, a group of X-ray astronomers mapped the X-ray photons received from the area of the Virgo cluster. If we examine the image that they published, you can clearly see that there was a line of X-ray photons connecting the quasar southwest of M49. If this quasar was at such a great distance, what could cause these X-ray emissions to behave like this? If we zoom out a little and include parts to the south, we can start to see the connection much more clearly. Here we find the quasar 3C273 at the end of this line of sources, connecting back all the way to M49. Now if we start to examine this area in gamma rays, something very startling appears. Now it's important to realise that the gamma ray photons that we receive are a thousand to a million times that of the X-ray energies that you would expect to come from only the interiors of the densest, most active extragalactic objects. So this should be highly concentrated, coming out almost point sources. But this is not what we see when we examine these objects in the Virgo cluster. They appear to be spread out over a vast distance and seem to connect these important objects together. In the image, we see Quasar 3C279, which is a violently variable, but also one of the brightest apparent magnitude quasars in the sky. It is actually classed as a blazar and is one of the brightest gamma ray sources in the sky. If we examine even higher gamma ray photons, this picture continues. In this image, we once more see a clear association between 3C279 and 3C273. More interesting is in this image that the majority of these gamma ray photons are emanating not from the objects themselves, but instead from the extended low density regions surrounding them. The researchers who conducted this survey were expecting the point sources. One of them was even able to demonstrate that the bridge stays constant while the quasars varied strongly in intensity, clearly demonstrating that the bridge was not a spillover light from the quasar itself. He even determined that the spectrum for the connection was very different from that of the quasar. If we examine cosmic rays, and these are about 100 million times higher energies than the gamma rays we've just discussed, then if we look at where these high energy cosmic rays are coming from, then you would not be surprised to find out that they are coming from the direction of the supergalactic plane and mostly from the supergalactic center, which is exactly where the Virgo cluster sits. How these high energy cosmic rays are produced is also a mystery and cannot be easily explained in mainstream science, with some suggesting that these are primordial, in other words, left over from the Big Bang. When calculations were performed to locate the origin, it was determined that they could not have a distance greater than 30 megaparsecs. And this means that they had to come from the center of the local supercluster, which is within about 20 megaparsecs, because this is the only significant concentration of material inside this distance. So empirically, we have bright quasars, sources of huge amounts of X-rays and gamma rays sitting right in the Virgo cluster, and they are the only possible connection to these ultra-high energy cosmic rays. And once more, we showed that their redshift is not an indication of their distance. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.